Welcome to WOW Worship on a Wednesday or whatever the day of the week you find yourself worshipping. This week's theme is money, sex and power and the characters we are reading about are Zebedee's sons and their mother. Reading from Matthew 20 verses 20 to 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favour of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When we look at the news and consider some of the stories and maybe the scandals that are recorded of individuals in positions of authority, they usually come under one or more of three categories, money, sex and power. Go on, just think for a moment about what we've seen in the news recently. Can you think of any other headings to add to this list of three. Please let me know if you do. Money, sex and power. The antithesis of these are poverty, chastity and obedience. Three aspects of a way of life entered into by many in religious communities. It is a calling, a vocation, to live in a community that is countercultural to the world in which we find ourselves. And Jesus lived that life that was countercultural to the world in which he found himself. And it was a very difficult requirement for many to get their head around. So let's just have a look again at the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee and consider not only what they are asking of Jesus, but also if we consider who they are, maybe we can understand why they are making this request. And so the reading begins, then the mother of Zebedee's son came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favour of him. We first hear of Zebedee's sons, named James and John, as being among the first who were called by Jesus to leave their nets and follow him. We assume they were fishermen, but was this their first encounter? Well, it is unlikely, for tradition tells us that their mother was Salome, sister to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and therefore James and John were his cousins. You will see the same Salome named at other times in the Gospels, often accompanying Mary, her sister, the mother of Jesus. And Salome was there at Jesus' death and was there ready with spices to prepare his body for burial. Prior to being followers of Jesus, James and John had been disciples and followers of John the Baptist. 
we know that John the Baptist was related to Jesus on their mother's side. So we can already begin to see something of a family tree of influence beginning to emerge. But also, these relationships go back a long way. And they are people who can bear witness to the nature of Jesus and give credible testimony to others. As disciples, James and John were members of Jesus' inner circle, alongside Peter. And these three were invited into the room when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. They also witnessed Christ's glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they were allowed to question Jesus privately on the Mount of Olives and went further with Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his arrest further than any of the others. But Jesus also gave them the nickname Sons of Thunder. In Luke chapter 9, as Jesus and his disciples stopped in the village of the Samaritans on their way to Jerusalem, the Samaritans refused to receive them and provide hospitality. Well, Luke writes that when James and John saw that their Lord had been disrespected, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Well, Jesus rebuked their hot-headed response by saying, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So, now we have a bigger picture of those, of who these people were. Salome, James and John. We can now have a look at what they were asking and more importantly, maybe why they were making this request and what testimony does it offer to the nature of Jesus? Salome, sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, it's fine for us to look back with hindsight, but what would life on the ground have looked like as this woman, Salome, watched her sister's son begin to rise in power and influence? Surely her sons being related to him and having been privileged enough to witness these amazing things, surely they might be entitled to a place around his table with a seat either side of Jesus? Well, we might suggest from our position of hindsight, what ignorance, how presumptuous of them. But come on, let's just step back a little and look again because this request is also a testimony. An eyewitness account of those who knew Jesus, probably from being a child. And yet here they are recognising where his kingdom was. His kingdom was a heavenly, divine kingdom of that much they were certain and they wanted to make sure they had a secure place within it, even though they were possibly a bit misguided as to what that kingdom looked like. And so Jesus reminded them that the kingdom of God is not about power and influence, lording over others, but rather is a kingdom built on love, justice, humility and service. Well, we may not all be called to live a life of poverty, chastity and obedience, but we all know areas in our life that need some readjusting things we need to say sorry for, and maybe even some things we need to turn our back on, changing direction altogether. So by God's grace, may our journey through Lent be one of enlightenment and relinquishing. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, may we see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen.
We continue in prayer and the following prayer was written by Anne Weems on Ash Wednesday 2003 at the outbreak of the Iraq war and I've edited, edited it slightly towards the end. Let us pray. I no longer pray for peace. On the edge of war, one foot already in, I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles. I pray that stone hearts will turn to tender heartedness and evil intentions will turn to mercifulness and all the soldiers already deployed will be snatched out of harm's way and the whole world will be astounded onto its knees. I pray that all the God talk will take bones and stand up and shed its cloak of faithlessness and walk again in its powerful truth. I pray that the whole world might sit down together and share its bread and its wine. Some say there is no hope, but then I've always applauded the holy fools who never seem to give up on the scandalousness of our faith, that we are loved by God, that we can truly love one another and that we can strive for a kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, a kingdom of love, justice, humility and service. I no longer pray for peace, I pray for miracles. Amen. We conclude with an old hymn, Grace that is greater than all our sin. <laughs>